Jen, hi, Enrique. Hello. Hello. Hi there. I just have a question for the, I, I heard that we can take the test anywhere we want. The MIB on, on Friday, or it should be just at the in training exam, or it should be just at, at the lab or because I'm in, in the veterans, so. Yeah, I can circle back with you after grand rounds or later this afternoon. Okay. Yeah. How do you turn this into a PowerPoint mode? Or something. Is it the slideshow button at the top of show? File. Oh, slide. Yeah, slideshow in the right. The big button on the right. Top right. Mm. Wait, by the blue share one. Left. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Can you tell right. those of us who don't use Google Docs? Okay, it's working. All right. <laughs> Success. Hang on. <laughs> All right, let me turn on this. Yeah, and you, you can get started whenever you'd like. I think people will continue to file in, so it's up to you. Oh, we're waiting for our leader. Roma. Oh, I thought I, I think she's here. Oh, great. Uh, there we definite, are. Definitely not the leader. <laughs> she, she's our leader. We, we need her.
Uh, sure. I should we get started? Sounds good. Okay. All right. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, happy Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this uh, QI uh, presentation today is a culmination of sort of our eight months worth of data gathering and work um, amongst the fellows. And um, yeah, so it is a project by all the fellows. And why we picked this project is one, um, I think that's something that is unique to a few states in the United States, such as here in Michigan, um, there is appears to be a lack of awareness that gabapentinoids are a class five controlled substances and that we recognize that there are safety concerns when we are prescribing these medications, especially with higher and higher doses, and especially when they are intermixed with opiates. And uh, we uh, were thinking that maybe there is some sort of lack of familiarity training in the workflow uh, about um uh about this and then we are coming uh with sleep we are in a unique field in that we are all coming from different specialties and training from family medicine neuro palm uh im peds and all of that and maybe we um maybe this is what uh, makes us have a uh, different understanding about uh, gabapentinoids and its effects. And the other part is the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has um, basically increased the flexibility of con um, prescribing these controlled substances in which a lot of the visits were done uh, virtually. Um, so uh, not all the patients were present for in-person care because of that limitation. And I will hand it off to my colleague, Dr. Gallup. Um, so this is how we scoped out our project. Um, this is where we're very thankful for Dr. Shelga Carr for helping us kind of put this together in a way that we could all visualize it. But we really tried to look for um, the four quadrants, high impact, low effort, high impact, high effort, low impact, low effort, and low impact, high effort projects. Um, these are the list of ones that we all came up with that we thought could have some improvement. Um, but at the end of the day, ended up going with the gabapentinoids and trying to standardize a process for which we could get controlled substances um, to our patients in a streamlined manner throughout the clinic. Um, so reason for action, this is a lot of what, um, Roma had talked about, but, um, control substances are something that we are commonly prescribing throughout the sleep disorders clinic, not just gabapentin, but the reason we really kind of went with gabapentin is it is schedule five. And so we were going to use this as our basis to then kind of build on top of there for a standardized process. So if we're doing it for gabapentin, we're going to be doing it for those that are, um, higher class scheduled medications. Um, these can have a higher degree of risk for both patients and our clinicians. Um, and we are responsible for as thing happens, especially if that documentation is not there where it's supposed to be. Um, and then we've also things that have come up, you know, not just in doing this project, but without this streamlined process and standardization throughout the clinic, we've noticed that patients are getting different care. So when they see one prescriber who doesn't recommend a urine drug screen and another one does, it unfortunately leads to patient dissatisfaction issues. Um, and that's something that we all um, hold in high regards is making sure our patients are satisfied with the care that they're getting and don't think that we're doing something um, just to them that we're not doing for anybody else. And so that's Michigan kind of where these things- Sleep disorder centers for quality assurance. Okay. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. No, it's all good. I was just like, oh, hold on. Um, so then the patient population that we are addressing. Um, it's really gabapentin is used for a ton of things, but how do we use it within the sleep disordered clinic? Um, and so restless leg syndrome, periodic lip movements of sleep, insomnia, hypersomnia slash narcolepsy. Um, we see it a lot in the chronic pain patients that we take care of as well. 
So in choosing our QI project, we thought about the six domains that uh, we had to consider. Um, of the six, there's safe, timely, effective, efficient, equitable, and patient-centered. And we have identified five of the six, but um, by definition, safe, we want to avoid injuries to the patient um, that we're trying to attend to help them. Timely is to reduce the wait times and even potentially given the long wait times it can it can harm them. Um, effective is, is doing these things in, in the basis of our own scientific knowledge. Um, efficient to avoid um, waste, whether it's through um, the channels of communication or supplies. Equitable to provide the care, um, um, not because of the patient's um, economic status, uh, geographic location, their gender, ethnicity, and um, patient-centered itself uh, in focusing uh, on the patient themselves. So we've identified safe, efficient, equitable, patient-centered, and timely. Anusha, you're supposed to be on the next slide. But I like, am. <laughs> yeah, so we identified safe, efficient, okay. patient-centered, and timely. Um, in, in terms of uh, a control five uh, uh, or schedule five uh, substance, we want um, patients to have safe care, um, if, efficiently prescribing these medications and giving them these medications, not based on um, what they've done in the past. And I think this was an issue when it comes to if, if they're prior a drug user or um, depending on kind of their, their profile um, and being able to prescribe these timely um, refills. So. And in this slide, our current state and how our workflow goes is that um, a clinician recognizes that um, uh, this medication is a control substance, then um, the clinician will kind of decide that, um, okay, we need a control substance agreement, or um, do we need to start talking form uh, in this patient's chart? Um, and this is done um, either during the clinic visit, between the visit, um, or even just covering someone else's in basket. Um, and once that and the control substance agreement uh, um, is decided that it is needed, um, it is then discussed with the patient, then both the clinician and the patient sign this control substance agreement, and then we place the prescription. Um, and this is either through by a patient's request, um, either doing the clinic as a follow-up or um, as a new patient. And uh, as an ongoing process, we will review um, MAPS and UDS when they're um, indicated and side effects. This then brings us to something called uh, the Gemba walk. Uh, so this is a little schematic of what that looked like and how we all kind of divvied up uh, the workload to kind of figure out um, what is the exact process that goes into controlled substance prescribing. Um, so you can see here, a couple of us tackled what are some of the legal ramifications or requirements uh, for controlled substances. Um, some of us actually reached out to other departments, including pain management, which, we, which is very helpful because they obviously prescribe a lot of uh, controlled substances. We talked to our front office and, uh, you know, we talked about these forms being filled out, how exactly, you know, once we hand this off to MAs or the clerical staff, what exactly happens with that? How does it get in the chart? Things of that nature. And then we wanted to kind of look at, um, you know, our specific clinic and what was the biggest uh, controlled substance that's that we were prescribing. And as we've kind of alluded to, gabapentin seems to be kind of the most uh, prescribed by sleep physicians, at least in our clinic here. However, as we know, a lot of stimulants and even opioids are also prescribed, which fit under that controlled substance um, category as well. Can we go to the next slide? So this is the kind of a, um, um, I guess, like a chalkboard uh, kind of review of what our thoughts were and kind of reviewing all of this. Um, we wanted to kind of start from, um, um, you know, that process that Steve alluded to of like, okay, we're, we want to prescribe this drug. What all goes into this? What, who all needs a controlled substance agreement? Is it legal? Um, and by divvying up the work and kind of trying to answer all these questions that are listed here, uh, we kind of formulated um, 
knowledge over the topic and also the workflow uh, for our sleep clinic. Um, so for example, uh, we learned that um, for uh, gabapentin and other uh, controlled substances that are not labeled as um, an opioid, um, there's strong recommendations to have documentation in the chart. However, it does not seem like anything is a requirement, uh, including urine drug screens, although urine drug screening is on our control substance agreement form if you do go over that with the patient. And so from a legal standpoint, there does seem to be some um, at the discretion of the prescriber and how they want to do things, which as you can mention, or as you can imagine, can be a little confusing for the patient if uh, other clinicians kind of do things a little differently. Um, however, for opioids, there does there is strict kind of guidelines that we need to start talking for them in the chart, um, and it has to be signed in person. And in some of our data collection, we did find a couple charts where this wasn't the case. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the form was never signed. There's a lot of opportunity for things to get missed or, or input into the chart incorrectly. Uh, but that could have um, some serious ramifications if anything were to happen for those patients. Um, we reached out to Dr. Garwood, the medical director, to kind of find out his um, um, thoughts on this kind of topic. Um, as I mentioned, we reached out to the pain management crew, which were really helpful in the start talking forums because they do a lot of opioids. Um, and they once again kind of reiterated that they get for gabapentin, there's not laws out there re um, requiring such things. However, he also agreed that there it is a good idea to have a controlled substance agreement discussion and some documentation of that discussion in the chart. And then we, as far as what exactly happens in this process, um, you know, let's say you complete the form and you hand it to the clerical staff, what exactly ha happens? Um, at least at the University of Michigan, there's a central scanning uh, um, workplace, basically off site from the hospital, usually takes about two business days. And this does get scanned into the media chart uh, or the media tab of Epic. And as we know, that can be kind of messy, uh, but there are filters that, um, we can kind of go into it in more detail, uh, but we did learn quick ways to kind of find some of these uh, forms, um, and that was kind of utilized in some of our data collection. Um, and I think that I think that kind of covers most of our Gemba walk as far as our process of data collection, uh, what our thoughts were, and the current workflow of our clinic. Okay, so to understand the problem or where the gaps lie, um, we should first discuss what should be occurring in the sleep disorder clinic. So for any patient, and just to review again, just any patient who is prescribed a controlled substance uh, needs to have the MAPS report reviewed as well as have an attestation uh, performed by the clinician. There should be a discussion in regards to any risks or benefits with the medication, as well as which medications should be held when taking these medications. Uh, there should also be a discussion in regards to refilling, who can provide those refills. As, as you know, multiple providers should not be prescribing the same controlled substance. And just like uh, Josh mentioned there, with the controlled substance agreement, it does mention a urinary drug screen. So that should be discussed with the patient. Um, and in regards to yearly visits, um, so with that COVID-19 pandemic, there was um, some flexibility in regards to should uh, the patient follow up virtually or in person, but now that there is no longer a COVID-19 pandemic, there needs to be that discussion with the patient that they may need to come in for their yearly visit in order to get their controlled substance refilled. So we asked the question, um, what percentage of adult patients who have a prescription for gabapentinoids 
place during this specific time frame. We decided on 8-1 to 8-29, 2023, um, specifically it, with Michigan Medicine Sleep Disorder Clinic. How many of these patients have a signed controlled substance agreement? And what we found was that 27% of the gabapentinoids prescribed within this four week period in the sleep disorder clinic have completed a controlled substance agreement and had documentation in the clinic notes. Uh, this uh, can increase risk related to regulatory, regulatory compliance for patients and clinicians. In addition, uh, we did note that there was that lack of standardized care where some uh, some providers were discussing the controlled substance agreement, ordering a urinary drug screen, whereas other clinicians were not discussing the controlled substance agreement, nor talking about risk versus benefit, at least per the documentation in the notes. So our specific aim for our QI project was really to uphold the new recommendations of the state of Michigan when prescribing gabapentinoids. Uh, there was a change in the class of controlled substance for gabapentin. It is now labeled a class five. And so our goal is really to mitigate any safety concerns um, that could occur when, uh, if the clinician is not discussing the risks versus benefits of these medications. Um, we want to create that standardization amongst all the providers uh, so that um, there isn't any confusion with the patient, as well as um, having the standardization will also uh, cover providers that are covering for other providers um, in regards to like having that proper documentation uh, when initiating the prescriptions and then continuing them as well. Jen, can I ask a question? Um, what did gabapentin be? What was gabapentin before it was a class five? So as far as I know, it wasn't a controlled substance before class five, <clears throat> and it's not in every single state as well. So some states gabapentin is not considered a controlled substance, but in the state of Michigan, it is class five now. And I believe this was sort of, sorry, sorry to interrupt. And I think this was started around 2019, especially with the rising opioid pandemic, uh, where they were seeing a rising trends of opioid related deaths, but I saw a higher incidence of that occurring when patients were on uh, carbapentin doses with the opioids. Um, perhaps that led to the change uh, in, in the Michigan state laws. I'm not too familiar, but I think that's what I was reading. Yeah, that's what um, led to a lot of it is the opioid epidemic and the respiratory suppression that comes from the mixing of opioids with gabapentin. Yeah. All right. Thank, thank all three of so, you. <clears throat> so, well, so in this particular case, what were we, we considered our efforts to find, of course, the patients who were on gabapentin and, and whenever they were initiated, if a discussion was made with the patient of the possible side effects and acknowledgement that this medication is a new controlled substance, um, or if this was, or if in this case a, a, a substance agreement was scanned into the chart in any case. Now, as a third point, we were also observing if any of these patients with gabapentin prescribed by us where we may be prescribed narcotics uh, by other departments. And if that's so, how many of those patients had actually a, a, a control substance agreement for the opioids or even for both? Um, so in the, in, the mes in the month of August of last year, uh, so we found that whenever we actually uh, prescribe gabapentin, uh, just of the 63 patients we saw, just one patient actually had uh, a form filled out. Of the patients we actually gave gabapentin, just 17, 17 cases had uh, discussed the possible side effects or discussed the potential harmful effects with this, partic with this particular medication, so it's just a 25%. 
And of those patients that we prescribed gabapentin, uh, around 18, 18 patients were on other narcotics. And uh, the methadone was there, something codeine, tramadol, uh, it was uh, the most the most of the common ones, but uh, but yeah, you 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 we saw that at least twenty five percent of the patients on gabapentin were taking also uh, narcotics. So, whenever we're seeing these 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 points, these uh, these results, what we are in. Our, our end and our goal for these particular patients and for us as, a, as providers in clinic is we want to decrease side effects. We want any treatment we give to be safe and we want better outcomes for our patients. And whenever we talk about a, a medication to be safe, it's also safe for the provider to decrease the amount of um, any medical uh, legal medical issues. Um, so we know at this, at this point, that the drug has been changed uh, to a, a schedule five. We know at this point that um, it doesn't let us prescribe the medication if we don't even review the map. So it's, it's already part of the system. So that's actually one of the positive points. We need to at least review that. But if we're already reviewing that and we are seeing these patients who are already narcotics, we uh, that 25% of patients on narcotics should have uh, a controlled substance um, uh, abuse contract in place. So we were missing that particular point. We already we already reviewed those patients on maps and we didn't do that extra effort. And uh, of course we want to uh, um, make it easier for us and remember ourselves how to go through the the, the most uh, the most common things that we may missed. And so we. Uh, uh, Roma was uh, nice enough to help us with a, a, a dot phrase for for us and to, to put into the system, so we can remind ourselves to do to discuss the patient uh, about the the potential harms, uh, the pos the possible UDS we need to order, the follow ups in six months and yearly follow ups, and of course, um, yeah, you can do the next one slide. And this is the the dot phrase that you know that the control agreement was in place that hopefully we did a scan we find we we uh we give the patient the the, the contract he filled it out he signed it we scanned it we review the maps and uh when we do we want these patients to to come to to see us um we we want this to be of course something regular that we make something we do it with in every visit uh because uh, of most of our patients, they their their medications constantly constantly changes, and they can be unaware that a different medication in the future may uh, uh, affect this patient. So it's really important to continue that education in every single of those visits. Um, yeah. Next one. Yeah. So after implementing the. The dot phrase, um, we were able to collect data from February 27th, um, January 27th to February 27th, and um, we have an updated result of a sample size of 60, um, where the control substance form that was done and completed in the media is now 15 compared to, I think, one uh, in the past. Um, and control substance agreement is now 26 of the 60, which is reflective of 43%. Um, and, and the same can be said for the um, concomitant uh, opioids, which is 12. Um, while we were hoping for perhaps a better number on the follow-up, despite implementing some of these changes, I think it is important to reflect some of, uh, you know, what are the barriers to change? Um, people, uh, as we pointed out, coming from different backgrounds, um, personally never had to prescribe a controlled substance, never, gabapentin for me was considered really benign um, until I was looking more into, especially the high doses that we prescribed in RLS uh, at times, uh, upwards of 1,200, 1,500, even 2,000. And especially a lot of patients who are on uh, opioids, opioid slows the gut motility, increases the absorption of gabapentin, causing the respiratory depression. So we have to be paying attention to these things. So 
obviously the whole uh, task of uh, getting a, a form, getting that sign, getting a UDS is very tedious. It, it's time consuming. It's extra work. And does it have legal ramifications? You know, right now it's it's controlled, but it's we're not going to be accounted by the law if we don't have a controlled substance compared to, say, the opioid start talking. But at the same time, I think even uh, those small changes were are are change is difficult. So I think um, I think this is a, a big step in in a small step in the right direction towards even if it was a forty three percent is 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 good for now. Um, I also think the fact that when I started or when all of us started, we had no idea about the Michigan state laws. We didn't know during even our orientation about the opioids or the gabapentins for that matter for Michigan. So I think uh, I would say lack of education was where as fellows we we came into, at least personally. I know uh, some of us were well equipped with this, but um, I think being aware about the current laws and requirements were also uh, something that had we started off with perhaps might have just from the get-go been more um, compliant with this. Um, uh, yeah, I think um, how that's kind of uh, where we stand with barriers to change. And I'll hand it over to Roma. Sounds good. So kind of looking back on when we were working on this project, working on the problems, the limitations, how we can address this, proposing next steps. We've learned a few things that um, as we're working on this. So one is one of the things that could be a barrier we, we, was we were thinking of maybe the dot phrase was too wordy and there needs to be a better process for incorporating this. Uh, we do know currently um, there's a couple of ways we can have the uh, controlled substance agreement by itself or it, it could be done on paper it's in the rooms or it, we could have you uh, or be uh, currently the other one is electronically through the through the epic smart set that's already incorporated through university of michigan but regardless it does take extra steps extra time to go through that and um, even having the conversation with the patient of having a discussion of the medication safety and all of that sometimes can take some time. So we were thinking that maybe the dot phrase can be too wordy and maybe it needs to be more streamlined. Maybe that was one of the barriers. And like I said, on the second point is it can sometimes be time consuming for, for discussion of this. Um, and then something that made us think about what else uh, could have been a limitation of how we can better address this project and be uh, incorporated in the clinics is that really um, reviewing the uh, trends theoretical model of behavior change and just to uh, refresh people in that there are typically six stages in order to make these behavioral changes as outlined below we're in. Um, we start off with the pre-contemplative uh, pre-contemplation in which um, a lot of times uh, a patient or someone can be resistant or lack awareness for the problem, or we underestimate the need to change. And then second step is being ambivalent about taking action, but we do recognize that maybe we do need to make a change. And then the further uh, steps are preparation for a change, taking action, and then the fifth one would be implementing this change and making uh, maintenance of this change and maybe preventing relapse. And then six is completely terminating uh, the, the change. I mean, the, the behavior, the previous behavior that we want. So by recognizing this model of stages of change, is that maybe it's an individualized process in that not everyone will be motivated with the same uh, thing for possible change. So for example, personally, uh, I came from a, a program that is has a lot of uh, um, uh, very rigorous when it comes to uh, making sure that there are controlled substance agreement, drug screen, and all of that. And this was in Cleveland. And uh, my program right in front of our, tr uh, our hospital is actually a law firm wherein they specialize in suing physicians. So um, I am, <laughs> um, um, uh, it was very, uh, ingrained in me to always be cautious and think about patient safety. So that was one of my uh, motivations for um, 
making this change and implementing this in my own practice. And then something that lastly, we do recognize that not everyone can be easily accepting of these change as outlined below. Um, and then for the next slide is some proposition that we've thought about how can we actually make this change, maybe not now, but maybe in the next uh, next steps for, uh, for the clinic is that um, accepting that one of the principles in motivational interviewing is that we identify and recognize that change can be difficult and that we can sometimes have resistance in making this change and that we right now our, our thinking is that we are rolling with the resistance and we are acknowledging uh, people's autonomy and differences and how they uh, how they want to practice but our goal is to really just provide the education and that again um, the change is going to be an individualized approach and that one of the things that we were thinking of is maybe we can consider a re-education down the road in which maybe we can revisit this again how the laws are and how our clinic workflow is maybe in the next six months and then uh, the other one is keeping each other accountable in that I borrowed this from the Department of Homeland Security in that if you see something, say something. So if you notice that a patient is on both gabapentin and maybe Norco that, and they don't have controlled substance agreement, no prior discussion about safety, that maybe this is something that we can uh, revisit uh, at, the next, uh, at the next visit for the patient. And these are our references. I think this is the last slide. That's a lot of work. And um, great job, all of you. Yeah. That was fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's it's wonderful and it and, and it is very helpful and we don't have uniformity and I think you helped a lot to push us along in the direction we need to go in. Yeah, really, really great, you guys. I will say the one thing is I find the smart sets more helpful for the controlled substance rather than the dot phrase, just because we have so many dot phrases we're supposed to remember. So I think as much as that being incorporated there is, is personally helpful to me. Yeah, and I think Roma had mentioned along the way that the smart the smart set it already has the benefit of being vetted by the institution because it's a system level resource, um, so extra work doesn't need to be done on that front if it's changed or updated. Yeah, I think it's um, we actually saw quite a few people using that smart set, which I think is great, and we did add those uh, that is part of the data that we collected. We did call that like a positive result that that was um, uh, completed with the patient, so. I don't think it's printed, right, and signed when we do it that way. I'm not actually sure. Correct, yeah, it's not, nothing prints when you do that, but um, we had the two categories where it was like, was a form actually uh, signed or was there at least documentation that this was discussed with the patient and that's where we included some of that smart set information. Um, and I think Dr. Goldstein just pointed it out in the chart. If you go through the smart set, it would have whether you want to do the gas chromatography, if you want to do the point of care drug screening, or if you want to do the urine testing, um, it would also have your codes for the ICD-10, whether you're doing medication monitoring, and that uh, one of the checkboxes is having a controlled substance signed. And if you go through the smart set, um, once you sign it, it would actually flag the patient's chart that there's an active controlled substance agreement. And then for future references, you can look um, and revisit that specific controlled substance agreement in which is it is it for gabapentin is it for norco is it for a benzodiazepine and then it can also be found in the other orders uh, under the patient chart um are you possibly like able to um 
go into my chart right now and and like open a big bird, whatever it is, practice patient and just walk us through and show how the smart set works or uh sure um i don't know if i know how to do like a, a fake patient but i do know there are previous patients that we've had no, I no i wouldn't do that and share it but i you could share just a um a big bird let me see if i have big bird is the name of like the mock patient yeah but if that's not, we certainly don't want to display any HIPAA information on screen share. We could also include. Uh, oh, so uh, the big bird. Yeah. Oh. I don't know if I have the exact one. Um, uh, I, I think I see one that's a big bird. Uh, let me see if I can actually pull it. Yeah, they have, it's big bird and then numbers or something else. I, Kathy, do you know? What a good practice. Patient. Use CDR test is what. Yeah, CDR test is the the practice patient that they want used now. All one word. You can search for it, and you'll get like CDR test five, CDR test seven, CDR test eleven. Yeah, if that's too hard to do on the spot, we can certainly do screenshots of how to do that. Do you want me guys, do you want to see the smart set right now? Yeah, I have I it up. I think it'd be very helpful. Do you guys see my my chart? Yeah, we can. Okay. So like this is a telephone encounter. So smart sets are available, obviously, in a few different types of encounters, obviously your visit, telephone, probably orders only. Um, and so in, if you're a telephone encounter in the call intake, the smart sets here, and you just click on that and you enter controlled. Um, and I think you can tag these and then you have controlled substance management versus monitoring. I don't know the difference. Let's say here. And open. Yeah, and so then it has um, all of these different options here um, that you can click on. So this, make sure you don't click on the point of care. I've gotten now paged multiple times for this because <laughs> we're not doing it point of care, we're doing it in the lab. So drug, you wanna do the UDS6 and you can make your own user version if you want with that selected already. So you don't have to re-click that. Um, and then this designates it's, signed. Um, here is the agreement. This ends up, I believe, printing in the ABS. Um, please keep in mind, this is not the same as a smart talking, a start talking form, which the start talking form, which actually is the, the mandate at the institution um, and at the state level. And that either is a hard copy signed in the media tab or a virtual um, smart talking smart phrase that you then have to attest to in the prescription. Um, the biggest thing that, that's helpful is to make sure um, that you have the active FYI that the controlled substance is signed. Um, oh, I must've done this before. Um, because what happens, so the way I do this so that when I'm going through my in-basket and you're getting a bunch of controlled substances, and you have to click, at least for the opioids, has a controlled substance been so or start talking or virtual start talking been done. If you hover over the active FYIs, you will see the controlled substance agreement come up. And you can even kind of label them. You can write like when they were done, if it was virtual or if it's a start talking that's scanned in on this date. So then I mean, it really improves efficiency because you're not then looking for that form every time you sign a controlled substance um, medication script. Does that make sense? So it's yeah, this, this FYI you. here that, that's really, really important. And this isn't something like if you do the start talking form and have it scanned in, 
this is not something that's going to automatically happen. You have to actively enter in a new flag. Hey, Kathy, quick question. Is this the sleep smart set or is this controlled substance? This is just smart. controlled substance smart set. So is that, how is that different? Because I actually usually go to the sleep smart set and we have controlled substance in there. That's how yeah, I we might have, it. it might be embedded in ours too. Um, it just, it the only thing I with just... the sleep smart set is if anything changes, you have to like, we have to go through hits to change the sleep smart set. Um, so like I would use the controlled substance one because if that is updated at an institutional level, when you search for it and use that one, it should be updated as opposed to our sleep one, which is, might be a little, um, stagnant. Yeah. Just typing in the word control brings up the entire Yeah. All you have to do is substance. type in control in the smart set. So it's pretty easy to find it. And Josh had also found out a way to look in the media tab uh, for a start talking form. I don't know, Josh, if you're able to share that about what you had learned um, when searching for that in the media tab. Yeah, I don't have my Epic open right now, but um, basically if you're under the media tab where the filters button is, there's an automatic checked um uh like box or a uh, section that's labeled as like admin let me look exactly i have the information here let's see it's called hide admin docs it's automatically checked in that section of media you have to uncheck it and then click on filters like you normally would and click on document type and that you can specifically look under control substance agreement. This is the section where you can, um, where the central scanning services is in placing uh, the start talking forms and the control substance agreements into the media tab. But you do have to click, basically unclick the hide admin docs and there's no way to like leave that unclicked unfortunately you'll have to click that every time thanks josh printed at the abs there's a patient sign at the when the patient is exiting the visit you can use that controlled substance smart set uh, please someone else jump in if i'm wrong um for even for virtual care for the telehealth visit. So there's nothing that they sign, but there your attestation is there that you deliver the information verbally. And then there's a component that goes in the AVS, but there's nothing that is signed. Uh, but that start talking form, and which is a requirement for the opioids, that's um that is different. That does require a signature. There's a there's a virtual smart talking um form that's fine too without a signature okay. currently. That could go away, but for star talking again required, there's a virtual option that's just an attestation where we don't get a signature. Ron and I even looked into seeing if we could get the patients to sign through the portal, and they said it wasn't available now and that the virtual um, start talking smart phrase was sufficient. But um, that being said, I think eventually that'll go away um, with the PHE end. Actually, that brings up so if we do print one out. And it's a virtual. Do we? Does the front staff mail it to the patient? Does anyone know? The prints out. I guess I've asked for that, but I don't know if it's anything automated. I don't think so. Anusha, I think connected with the pain clinic about how their workflow. I don't know, Anusha, if you want to speak to that about how they do it, at least. I, I'm not sure about the copies being mailed to the patient, honestly, but I know that. Uh, similar to to uh, the sleep clinic, they also had to see some patients virtually or if they say discharged from the hospital, they connect with them on Zoom, but then they do expect them to come in within the six month or one year to sign that opioid start talking form, which uh, in the visit gets printed out, they sign it, and then we just hand it to the front desk who scans it into the media tab. Um, do they get a copy for themselves? I don't know. I... 
I'm not sure they go home with that. So that's not something required during the PHE. So that's like so there's a lot of questions about the PHE and what will happen with these people who we've never physically seen and were prescribed opioids with a virtual start talking and, and don't have a wet signature on anything. And right right now they're letting us continue that. But they're at least in through December of 2024. We thought it was going to be ended sooner and we were having this panic with scheduling. I don't know if everyone remembers, but that's currently still allowed. There's no requirement during the PHE and the PHE extension for a six month or a year follow up in physically in person to get a hard copy signed. But that's probably going to end. Um, and people who we've never seen in person are going to have to be seen physically at least once um, before we can prescribe an opioid to them. Yeah. Thanks, Kathy. And I think she was relaying the the pain clinic, which made they it sounds like they had a more rigorous. Yeah, which is probably good that they did that. Yeah. Yeah. What is this? Is the, it's a smart phrase or a dot phrase for the virtual smart talking? What was the question? What is the, I'm sorry, what is the dot phrase or smart phrase for the virtual start talking document? Dot virtual start, we'll bring it up. Uh, virtual, let me try it. Yeah, dot virtual start talking. And that goes in your clinic note. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. And if you do that, though, again, or even a physical start talking, please put in the active FYIs, please flag it. It makes it a lot easier, too, if people are covering your in-basket so they don't have to go searching for that document when they get a refill request or a fill request. Excuse me. Thanks. Uh, Mark? Yeah, no, ex excellent job, everyone. And I think uh, a great choice of a uh, project because I think uh, uh, I think it helped us learn some things. I know you probably learned some things too. So I uh, I think gabapentin, especially focusing on that in, in the gabapentinoids, uh, is interesting as well. So uh, I might be a little bit on the resistance side of using a controlled substance for gabapentin in, in that class of drugs. Uh, with that said, I... I really think that we should be using controlled substance agreements a lot more than we are, and we're not for for like the for stimulant drugs, especially uh, uh, Adderall and Ritalin and those drugs and and and, and others. So um, for me, um, when I think of gabapentin, I've used it for a long time. So I'm trying to think of what's my resistance coming from the from a from a neurologist that's been in practice for you know, quite a few years. So I've prescribed it numerous times. I've never seen any issues. I think that the respiratory suppression is small. I've had some patients, even without doing a controlled substance agreement, voice concerns to take the drug because they heard it was a controlled substance and they almost wanted to stop. That was after it became a controlled substance. I view it's pretty low risk. Um, I, I do like the idea of standardization. I think that, uh, uh, but for me, that's, I think it's more sp specific to gabapentin lyric. I think the respiratory suppression is small. I, I question how it would compare to trazodone or Seroquel or many other sleep aids. And uh, certainly I'm not concerned with addiction. So often my conversation is it is a controlled substance. I'll educate patients. I'll say it's a controlled substance because in the past it was often misused or abused with opioids that did occur. So sometimes it was mixed with IV drugs. It wasn't solely, you know, patients managed with restless legs, for example, that were on an opioid and, and gabapentin. So I think there could be some risk. I think counseling somebody, if they were on those for maybe restless legs, you had somebody on opioids and gabapentin, that there could be some added respiratory suppression. But I might, I might question managing a patient with gabapentin the same way as maybe we would choose to manage somebody with opioids in terms of a urine drug screen, especially. I think that could be a little labor intensive and it, and it might be sending a patient the wrong message. I'm just curious if, I'm curious if Punitha's thoughts, knowing she's probably prescribed gabapentin a couple times and, uh, and just and maybe Jordan's and, and some others. Yeah, Mark, <clears throat> I agree with you very strongly. Um, I think that this is a great project in terms of um, discussing the importance of making sure that we're counseling our patients, the risks and benefits of medications. I personally think some of the risks that the 
fellows have been articulating is a little bit overblown when it comes to gabapentin specifically and exactly what you're saying about the urine drug screen. So um, I'm someone who is still going to counsel all my patients about gabapentin and like the risks of this and the possible interaction with opiates. And the reason that I don't do controlled substance agreement for gabapentin is part of that like urine drug screen requirement because even when you guys were presenting as fellows saying like urine drug screen is not a legal requirement for gabapentin, it's not a legal requirement, it is something that is listed in the controlled substance agreement, but then that sort of raises the question of, well, then should we be doing the controlled substance agreement versus the dot phrase, which I think is a great idea and gets at the same kind of idea in terms of both legal coverage, as well as just making sure the patient is well informed. Um, so yeah, I agree with your uh, judgment, Mark. And then for the fellows in terms of the QI like learning points from this, I feel like perhaps the learning point would just be uh, more discussion with stakeholders can be helpful because like here are some of us who are the ones prescribing who are saying we feel a little bit resistant to the specific intervention you guys are using as your outcome, which is how many controlled substance agreements got signed for gabapentin versus the outcome of perhaps using of a specific dot phrase or even picking a medication other than gabapentin. Uh, anyway, that's kind of my feedback. Yeah. Thank you for that. I was wondering before Punita, before if you were going to weigh in, I don't know if you were going to, uh, if I guess if someone from the group could just add clarity on what the measures were that were looked at and kind of how the group came to gabapentin, because this was a, a long topic of conversation too, as to how to narrow the scope given the time frame, uh, And also if someone could just speak to Jordan's comment about what uh, was looked at uh, pre and post countermeasure. So previously, our our thought was mainly our work was on opiates, but since opiates should be um, should be done, you know, uh, ha having the chart uh, a discussion about the drug, have a consent sign, and it is it is preferred to have a, a constant monitor of the drug screen. We didn't want to make it. Mm, our point of priority for this department because we, the drug that the control substances is not as, as strong with, with opiates. But as we saw, people with opiates, even in the department, they were not getting enough information and, and or talked about the side effects or a consent. So on those patients with methadone or other drugs, we saw a little, uh, not that much communication in the chart. Maybe there was in the meeting talking to the patient, but not in the chart. So we circle back just to, since now the appending is an, a new drug in, in class five. And so we wanted to, to see how many of those patients, we talked about the side effects, uh, but we, we were mostly, um, a, mostly discussed about, uh, did you talk about it as a measure, just measurement? We didn't want to, talk, to have everyone to have a controlled substance agreement. That was not our measurement. It was one of the possibility measurements, but if you, even if you talked in your chart, side effects were discussed, we took it as a win. We took it as one of the possible, was one or the other. Um, so yes, so just talking about the side effects counted. So whenever we choose those three things was one, the, did you talk about the side effects? Two, did you put a, a, a consent? Or, or and if this patient was also in narcotics. So yeah, we are we are with everyone that maybe uh, a, a consent and having a written consent for every single, just about Benton or Lydica is maybe uh, some difficulty, but just putting in the chart or anywhere, whenever we started the medication in the chart, um, talking about the side effects and or the uh, concurrent use with other drugs could be detriment for the patient. Yeah, I'll just kind of second that too. I, I'm kind of in the unique boat too of being neurology trained. And this is something I actually brought up to the group of saying like, this was never stressed. And I trained in West Virginia where opioids were like, you know, like candy. Um, and we'll kind of get that bad label uh, from the opioid pandemic. But um and uh, but it was it was, in, I guess, encouraging even for me just to kind of know, like maybe some of the legal ramifications. And a lot of our department does do a, a good job of 
of describing exactly what Dr. Stanley said, like, hey, I usually document the risks of things and why it's labeled as a controlled substance. And so that's why we added that measure in our data collection that maybe we weren't initially thinking. We were looking for the controlled substance agreement form, but then kind of uh, lessened that idea of saying, and, and instead just kind of had this idea of saying, uh, you know, hey, there is some flexibility here, but because it is a, in our state, labeled as a, a Schedule 5, this should at least be um, told to the patient and uh, side effects and kind of, uh, you know, potential side effects, I'll say, um, at least addressed in the notes. Because if it's not in the notes, then legally it never happened is kind of the rationale there. Um, and so that's why that was like our main um, finding. The main thing we were looking for was, was this at least documented in the form of a discussion, then uh, we considered that uh, appropriate. I think the process you guys are describing is a great example of the iteration of quality improvement projects in terms of deciding which medications you wanna focus on or which single medication, whether you're, again, you're doing the controlled substance or you're doing some other version of it. So I think this is a great kind of example of this for you to take going forward. Thanks, Jordan. Yeah, and I'll say when the group was discussing, you know, they had settled on wanting to do something about controlled substance regulation and prescribing and, and documentation and all the things that they presented at the beginning. Um, and then when it came to scope, I think that's part of why the group focused on one class of drugs and not all controlled substances, because in the time frame that they have to work on this project, that would have been a little uh, unyieldy. So that's why they focused uh, with the intent of extrapolating and fine tuning and iterating as they go along. Well, Sorry, kudos to all of you on a fabulous project. You all did an excellent job. Well done. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good job. All right. Thank you. See you guys. See you. Ooh.